Good morning and good afternoon, church family. It's so good to be worshiping with you again today. Uh, it's been almost 20 days since the death of George Floyd. It's easy to get angry at what happened, at those police officers who misused the power given to them, uh, those bystanders who did nothing to stop the killing. Eight minutes and 46 seconds of injustice and inaction, to be exact. This really has brought, us, brought before us this issue of racial injustice. We're all trying to grapple with what happened, what has to change. We know that our system is broken. There is a systemic injustice that is done against not just the minorities, but especially more so against the black community in our nation. So the question is, how do we change that? What do we do about it? The question that I've been wrestling with this week is this. Am I a racist? Is there any sort of bias or partiality towards a certain group of people? Of course I do, and we all do. I have certain types of people I like. I have people that I don't like to hang out with, maybe not from this church. Uh, I am becoming more selective as I get older on who I spend time with and who I invest my life into. As a church, we have our own ethnic, cultural preferences. I remember walking into an African-American church on one Sunday when I was looking for a place to worship when I was traveling alone. It was probably one of the, the strangest experiences I've ever had. The music that they played was weird. Their prayers were weird. They were all praying in tongues half the time. The message was really long-winded, and it was hard being there for almost two and a half hours. And at the end of the service, they actually invited me to stay for a meal, and I had to come up with some bogus excuse to leave that place. See, we all have the type of music, type of sermons, or type of people we enjoy having around. That's how we choose our church, our friends, and our communities. So does that make us racist? Or when does such preference become racism? Before I answer that question, we are going to look at a very familiar passage. It's, it's the passage that the Lord has been pressing onto my heart for the last couple of weeks. It comes from Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 27. If you have your Bible, follow with me. Uh, it's going to be on the screen as well. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed, on, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as they journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. You've heard me teach on this story, but I never thought that this parable would become so profoundly meaningful to what we are going through at this moment. Uh, let's quickly go through the story. First of all, we need to understand why Jesus is telling this parable. It was an answer to a question that a lawyer asked. What must I do to have eternal life? Uh, Jesus, in his typical rabbinic fashion, he lets him answer his own question. What does the law tell you? And this lawyer proudly answers, 
You should love, you, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, then love your neighbor as yourself. This is what the law says. And Jesus says you answer correctly. Now, if somebody came and asked me today, Pastor, what must I do to get saved? What must I do to have eternal life? I'm not sure if this is the answer I would have given to him. I would have probably said, accept Jesus, believe in him, get baptized, and, and join a faith community, join a small group, and let's do Bible study together. But Jesus told the lawyer, do exactly what you just told me just now. You have to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind and, and strength, and, and then love your neighbor just as you love yourself. We, you and I know that this is impossible. Not only that, the question that this lawyer asks is, what must I do? There's a strange wordplay going on. What must I do? One time, and Jesus says here that be doing this. Continuously do this and you will live. He's making it even more difficult. Then he goes on to tell this story, the story that you and I know very well. There are five characters, but we're just going to focus on the first three. The first one is a half-dead man. He was going from Jerusalem to Jericho, and this tells a lot. This was a very treacherous 17-mile descent with many rocky and desert places. This place was known as a path of blood. It's the neighborhood where you're not supposed to hang out. To the Jews, it was also more than just a danger that the area presented. It was also an unclean place. Jerusalem symbolizes the city of God. God's government. Jericho often represents the city of man, man's government. So this man was going away, going downhill, away from the city of God towards the city of man. And then he gets robbed, beaten, and left dying. He's in desperate need of help. And there are two kinds of people that pass by, one priest and the other Levite. If I can modernize the language, we're talking about a pastor and a worship leader. Now, these two people combined represented the whole of the religious system of the Old Testament, period. Why would they pass by? It was because of the law. They were both trying to observe the letters of the law. This dying man, covered in, in his own blood, was considered unclean, and, and they did not want to break their covenant with God. There was almost this invisible line, the religious line that they had to cross in order to get to this dying man. And that line for the priest and Levite was too cost costly to cross. They had too much to lose. Their reputation, their status, maybe their position and their dignity. Now, if I can imagine what was going through their mind, probably there was a little bit of fear that was at play as well. Maybe they were on some kind of important mission and stopping and caring would cost their mission. Now, all these reasons, perhaps legitimate, held them back from crossing that invisible line to save this dying man. So Jesus goes on to tell the rest of the story. And out of all who pass by, who stops and crosses that line? It was a lowly Samaritan. Now, we need to understand a bit of history to see why this is such an odd story. Samaritans were the most hated kind in those days. In the Gospel of John, we, we know uh, we have another story of Jesus going over to speak to a Samaritan woman, and it was a big no-no at the time. Even, even the disciples were puzzled at Jesus' action and questioned his intent. Now, they were the subject of all kinds of discrimination because of their racial and religious heritage. Samaritans were the half-breed Jews who had forsaken their racial and religious purity and intermarried with Gentiles and had fallen into all kinds of idol worship. They were the kind that betrayed Yahweh. It's hard to understand the rift that existed between the Jews and Samaritans, but if I can again give you an example, imagine the hatred between Catholics and Protestants in Northern Ireland or Christians and Boko Haram in places like Nigeria. That will give you just an idea or taste of what this relationship between these two groups of people were like. And out of the three that passed by, it was not the priest or the pastor, it was not the Levite, the worship leader, but it was someone who was considered an apostate, is the one who crossed that invisible line to save this dying man. 
Now, there are so many layers of lessons that we can learn. Jesus is really trying to teach us here, but I want to focus on what the Spirit of God has been saying through this passage lately. This parable, to me, is really God's indictment against the institutionalized religion that has drifted away from the true, its true purpose and mission. This is not the first time that God came down so hard on his people. Uh, if you go back to the Old Testament, Isaiah 58 talks about this. God says, shout the message. Don't hold back. Say to my people Israel, and he says, you've sinned. Day after day, you worship, you fast, pray, and you ask about justice. You ever wonder why the Lord pays no attention to you? You fast in the name of God, and in the end, all you think about, all you care about is yourself. Then he goes on to explain what true religion or true fast he desires. To loose the bonds of, the, uh, of wickedness. To undo the straps of yoke. To share your food with the hungry. To provide for the poor with shelter. When you see na the naked, to clothe them. And not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then you call on me and I'll answer. I'll bring healing. Then I'll guide you and bless you and strengthen you. Now Jesus here in this story is pretty much repeating Isaiah 58 to this lawyer. The teacher of the law who professed to be the lover of God's word, who's supposed to be teaching his people about the true religion, he's saying, you of all people who is supposed to teach the law of God have forgotten what the law is all about. You have drifted from the heart of your religion. And I believe that God is shouting right now the same message. He's shouting against his own people, his church. You have forgotten what your faith is all about. You fast, worship, you do all these things, but in the end, you do these things only for yourselves. Isn't it really interesting that out of these three who pass by the dying man, the one that reaches out is the one that was outside of the Jewish faith. The same thing is happening today. As we have seen the oppression and injustice against the black community, the ones that are crying out the loudest are not the ones within the church. In fact, the church has been pretty much silent, removed, ignorant, indifferent in many ways all these years. And I realized that even for myself, I've been like that priest or Levite in this story. What we call church today has become more like a social club where we get to hang out with the kind of people we like. We're all guilty of that. And we keep things the way we like so meticulously that there is actually no room for others to really feel belong. We don't do it intentionally, but it happens. So the question I asked earlier is, Am I a racist? Yes, I am. We all are. The issue at heart is really not about our race. I rather call it, instead of racism, I want to call it kindism. Uh, we all prefer our own kind, whether it is our ethnicity, socioeconomic, or cultural background. We feel more comfortable hanging out with our own kind and largely neglect those that are outside of our circle of preference. We create cliques, factions, clubs, and as long as my belonging is secure, everything is fine. This is the injustice that God is exposing. I have a few African-American friends who have really helped me to understand what they're going through in this season. But I realize that I only know how to empathize with them or feel sorry for what they're experiencing, but I honestly do not know how to enter into their world, how to cross that line. So the question I want us to wrestle with today is not whether I am a racist or, or uh, we are racist. That, that's not the right question. Racism or kindism is, is in all of us, but the real question is what are we going to do with the, the racism or kindism that, that is so woven into our nature? And what are we going to do with the injustice that we see around us? See, what I believe that the Spirit of God is calling us to is not so much that we should go out and, and fight against this injustice and try to change our system that, that is wrong, that is broken, but 
God wants us to really live out what the kingdom of God is like, to model, to demonstrate, to incarnate the kingdom of God. You know, the kingdom of God is neither color biased nor color blind. It celebrates the ethnic, cultural, racial diversity. If you read Revelation chapter 7, it gives us what the bride of Christ will look like on the day of Christ's return. There before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb of God, crying out, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. This is the vision of the church. This is the reason why we cannot hold on to our kindism. This picture in Revelation chapter 7-9 is, is not just a description, but also a prescription for the church. You and I are called to make this vision a reality. This is why we cannot insist on being a Chinese-only church or Asian church, although we should celebrate our Asianness. This is why having a Korean pastor is, is a beautiful kingdom thing. And to embrace and walk with people from different background, culture, ethnicity, it's not an easy task. But it is a kingdom calling. The most beautiful thing about the Bride of Christ and His kingdom is that these people who are not the same kind, who had nothing in common in their culture, language, status, are actually standing not just in equality, but in perfect unity and love because of their love for the bridegroom. So how do we overcome the injustice we see in this world? Where do we begin? It begins within our own family, in our own heart. There are people, even within the church, that are from different background, ethnicity, social, and economic status. Do you know that we have a family from Nigeria who are now part of our church family? Do you know that we have a family from Iraq who are pastoring an Arabic-speaking congregation here in San Jose? Do you know that we have an uh, Eritrean family that have been part of our church plan since the beginning? Learn how to enter into their world. Learn how to cross that line of comfort, ethnic or social, cultural divide. Listen to their stories and learn to share their joy and their pain. I want to remind you, Jesus in this story, Jesus is the Samaritan who crossed that invisible line, that infinite chasm between God and man. Jesus is the one who did not ignore but cross his line, costing him everything. And he's asking us to do the same. Today I want to give you a little bit of time before Douglas comes up to pray uh, for us. I want to give you some time to reflect on what is what God is saying to the church in this season. Uh, maybe spend a little bit of time really aligning our hearts with, with what God sees and how he feels about us. I'm going to be scrolling uh, some of the verses from Isaiah 58 that we read earlier, and uh, I'll have those words really sink deep into your heart uh, to change the way we're actually going to live out the gospel in the days ahead. Will you... Let the Holy Spirit speak to you powerfully in this moment.
Will you join with me in prayer? God, we thank you for speaking to us today. We thank you, Lord, for just speaking to our hearts and really examining our hearts and asking those tough questions. Father, as we hear about what's going on in our world, Lord, we ask that you would come and speak to us through your words. That, Father, as we reflect, as we see beyond really ourselves, even our skin tone, even the injustices of, the, of this world, Father, we ask, Lord, that you would give us this kingdom perspective, that you would help us to see eternally, Lord, that at the end, Lord, when we all come before your throne, you desire for all peoples, all tribes, all nations to bow down and worship you. And so, Father, we pray that you would give us that spirit of worship, give us that spirit of togetherness, that we would really appreciate the diversity that you have created, that you would we would appreciate, Lord, all the peoples that are different from us that you have created because you have a design for each one of us. So God, we thank you for giving us the eternal perspective. Thank you, Lord, for showing us how to love each other, God, how to really respond in a kingdom manner. So Lord, we pray that even as we go from here, that you would help us to maintain that kingdom perspective, that it would not be what the world or what the media is saying, but God, that it would be what you are saying from your word. Thank you, Lord, for this reminder um, of the Good Samaritan and how um, you challenge us to cross over, how you challenge us to care, how you challenge us to love. So Father, we ask, Lord, that even as we go from here, that your word would remain in our hearts and that we would be able to live it out this week, that we would be able to see God from your perspective. Thank you, Jesus, for it's in your name we pray. Amen.